Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the first SCAMP workshop of the new year. Today's topic is building fundraising capacity to fill gaps on projects, finance, growth, and support operations. I first want to give a, a shout out and a big thank you to Nina Dooley, uh, one of our board members who brought this idea to us. Uh, and uh, now we're doing it. This is great. Um, here at the start of the freshman year, we thought it was a good idea to take time. This was as good a time as any to find to, to help fine tune organizations fundraising fundamentals. And we have an excellent group of speakers to help us today. Amber Sheik is the Chief Impact Officer at Sheik Impact. Uh, Nina Dooley is the Vice President of Corporate Development at Link Housing. Amalita Pasquale Ami is the Regional Director of Philanthropy at Mercy Housing. Uh, this session is gonna focus on many examples related to nonprofit developers in particular, um, including some interesting case studies, but we'll get into some of the essential strategies on fundraising and communications that are applicable to multiple audiences. So Amber, uh, with that, I hope that you can kick us off. Hey, thanks, Alan, I will do so. Um, these are always funny because I can't like see the audience, but I just see the numbers growing. So hi out there. Um, let me share my screen and I will bring up my PowerPoint, which will be the backdrop for what we're gonna chat about. Um, stay with me for a moment. Um, here we go. Give me a thumbs up panelists if you can see that. Can we see it? Okay, good, thank you. All right, hi everyone. So uh, my name is Amber Sheik and I'm Chief Impact Officer, owner of Sheik, Sheik Impact, um, formerly Thurlow Associates for the last 30 years. And today we're gonna chat about breaking into private philanthropy. So the goals for what I'm gonna talk about today are kind of explore ways in which nonprofit housing developers can strengthen private fund development and enhance sustainability, kind of explain the landscape and help you develop a toolkit. And this came out actually, so um, a good amount of folks know me as a very, very active homeless advocate in our region. And this work very much ties together my professional expertise as a fundraiser and nonprofit consultant and my every other hour of the day passion, which is finding solutions to end homelessness and alleviate homelessness in our region. And my background, I started working in permanent supportive housing about 15 years ago on Skid Row, um, doing our, some of our first PSH developments. But over the course of especially the last several years, as we as a municipality have come up with funding to fund you know, affordable and permanent supportive housing, at a scale that we've never seen before, I've noticed more and more nonprofit housing developers talking to me about, oh my goodness, I think we're gonna have to like fundraise as well. <laughs> and so I think this is a very highly relevant topic for many of us right now, given the thrum and the, the amount of development going on and how much we're having to fill in the true cost of building and not just building, but operating programs that are that work. Um, and so that's what I want to explore today is nonprofit housing developers actually compared to other nonprofits are enviable, I'll be honest, in the kind of funding they put together and the streams that they have access to. But most nonprofit housing developers are a little behind when it comes to building a philanthropic pipeline because they've never really had to to the same extent. So we're going to chat about that today. So why do we, and I'm going to say we for nonprofit housing developers, I'm going to count myself as you today, why do we need private philanthropy? And some of those ideas include things that private philanthropy can cover. So where, I mean, the biggest question is where do you currently have gaps in your funding for projects you're building and programs you're trying to run? Is it in supportive services, which and if you are running your own supportive services, you know that reimbursements almost never cover the full cost of running a quality program. Uh, ground floor spaces in your development. So is that, a, is that a clinic? Is that a social enterprise? Program evaluation for you to really show your impact. Pilot projects, if you wanna try something new and, and you maybe can't attract other funders. And then ancillary services to strengthen your PSH. So I think, I think of a lot of you that I know out there that are doing work that goes over and above your scope of work and what you're charged to do because you know it works and it helps people stay housed. 
Um, so those kinds of things, how can we get funding to cover those? So diving right into funding sources and strategies. And just so everyone knows, there will be questions and answers at the end. So you can gather those along the way. Um, but another good piece of news right now is when we're looking at the philanthropic landscapes, when we're talking about foundations and individuals, especially in our most current landscape around COVID, what we're seeing funded is vital needs. What do donors see as vital needs? Um, and of course, what you do is an absolute vital need, if not the, the one of the major solutions to our largest humanitarian crisis right now in the region. So you all fit, check this box wonderfully. Uh, leveraging funding, and that's something philanthropic uh, donors want to really see, which is another area that nonprofit housing developers have in spades, honestly, because they do have this robust pipeline of other kinds of funding than film tropic funders usually see. And then ensuring equity. Equity in our region with our foundations and large individual donors is obviously one of the most important things. And that is literally the core of what you're doing is ensuring equitable access to housing and, and life and you know getting back on your feet, thriving as an individual, all of the things that we are actually doing when we develop housing, even if it's not what we're concentrated on all day, every day. Um, and I, I have a couple slides here just to give you a snapshot. If you're not aware of common nonprofits, so not nonprofit housing developers, but most 501c3s, what their um, funding makeup is, just to compare yourself. So if you look at this, this is how the average nonprofit uh, raises funding to make 100%. So you have individuals, foundations, corporations, bequests. A little different than how most of yours looks. And these are the, the pieces of the pie that we talk about a lot. So you have fee for service, foundation corporate, public grants, um, all just to give you an idea of what you are competing with and why you also might look more competitive. So break into philanthropy. What do you need? What do you need to have in your toolkit to be able to ask foundations and individuals for funding. So the first thing I always say is a case for support. Um, and that's gonna be very different looking than what you would use to fulfill like an RFP in development. As a case for support is telling a story of how there is a need and you are meeting it uniquely. We'll go over that a little more on the next slide, but that is something that I think a lot of nonprofit housing developers are, are going to have a little trouble getting to it first with some resources is how to tell that story in a way that is compelling and kind of takes your car and fits it in the garage of philanthropy. Obviously a 501c3, um, which is why a good amount of uh, nonprofit housing developers also sometimes have a foundation arm. Uh, audited financials, something that most Non uh, most foundations especially are gonna ask for, especially given the size of grants you'll probably be going after. A fundable budget, and this is something I could teach a whole workshop on because it has to look different than the kind of budget you are showing to perhaps an investor or a vendor, because it has to be fundable, which means there has to be a funding gap. So you, even if you want it to zero out at the end, what you need to show is that private philanthropy is necessary to make your program work. So just keep that idea in your mind that the budget has to be fundable. You can't go to someone and say, I need $100,000 without showing that you need $100,000. So <laughs> um, this is a big one, obviously, for folks that are working in a world where that is not common practice. Elements of a pitch is my next one. And that actually works in tandem with the case for support. So your case for support is going to actually be more of a, a document, this like large document that has all of your information into it that you can pull from. But elements of a pitch are going to be something that takes all of that and makes it a pithy statement um, of there's five elements to a pitch. There's who you are. There's what you, what you, like what the need is for you, your organization, what you are doing uniquely, uh, how you evaluate that or what your outcomes are, and then what you need, so the ask. And so um, that is something, you know, 
you need to have in your back pocket when just doing simple outreach calls. And then of course, reporting and stewardship strategy, because when you're building a pipeline, it's not a, it's not a one-stop get the gift and get out. It's, it's a constant uh, relationship. We'll go over that kind of in a later slide as well. So I put this up here, the case for support, because I also, I'll liken this to a lot of conversations I have with people who say, I want to form a nonprofit because I want to do some great things. Um, and my first question to them is always, what need are you meeting? And are you meeting it uniquely? And uh, actually more often than not, the answer is, well, someone else is doing it, but maybe they're not doing it as well and, and blah, blah, blah. And I usually say, okay, well, you should partner with that person because you may not actually be as competitive for funding if you are not fulfilling that need in any kind of unique or new way. Now, luckily for most of you, you are fulfilling a very well known need um, and you are doing it in a unique way because you are doing it, period. And we need more of what you do. We need more and more and more. So when you're thinking about a case for support, these are kind of the questions that you just need to make sure that answers. And even if you're doing it in a case for support, like a one sentence case for support and not your you know, 10 page document you end up with, think about what, what need are you meeting? How do you meet it uniquely? And then what do you need to accomplish that? And that is really all you need to answer. And then of course, um, give that a lot more detail. <laughs> Donor development framework. So this, if you've never done private philanthropy or private donor cultivation, this is sometimes a new concept, but it's a, I think of it as a circle, but you start with research and identify. So you're researching potential donors and you're identifying them, pretty obvious. And then you're outreaching and cultivating them. Once you have a good idea through that cultivation, which is a lot more listening than talking, actually, you have a good idea of what to ask for because you've listened enough to understand what the individuals or foundations want to fund. And there comes the solicitation and ask. Hopefully that's a nice right-sized ask by that point. And then you continue to engage and steward that gift and then it continues. This isn't a, a one gift opportunity we're hoping. So it keeps going over and over again. And that is your relationship with donors that you have to form. So some quick tips to grow your donor program, especially if you're starting from a small place or ground zero is first thing is to identify your natural donor base and donor archetype. So this is a big one. Um, my joke I use a lot is that boards, new boards will tell me like, well, you know, Bill Gates gives a lot or Bon Jovi gives a lot. And it's like, do you know Bon Jovi? Do you know Bill Gates? No, you don't. So, and are they even your natural donor base? No, they're not probably. So you identify who would give to you, who is interested in the work you do. And I actually consider this a fun process to do with your board and other stakeholders and your staff to think about like actually literally making the profile of who would be interested in your work down to details. Like what do they look like? What do they do for a living? What motivates them? Where do they go on vacation? Just ideas that really give you an idea of what your several donor archetypes are so that you can also manage your time and resources. We don't need to go after everyone. Uh, leverage existing connections. So that's obviously your board is a great place to start. Even if you don't have a fundraising board doing some relationship mapping to see who knows who and how far that goes out. Um, also anyone that's in touch with your, you know, your vendors, the other people you work with on your projects. Um, the next one is data plus stories. And I say this a lot on cases for support. You want to balance those two. So um, a lot of funders use the phrase, no data without stories, no stories without data. And so you are speaking to individuals that want to make a difference. So you have to give them the information. They need to feel that their gift will do that, both with data and with stories. Um, case for support, I cannot really just land on this enough how important it is to have a solid one. Another way is event follow-up. If you have, um, for example, I'll give you an example, uh, Nina from Link Housing on this call, they do awesome uh, tours of their facilities where they're bringing in various stakeholders that touch their projects in lots of different ways. 
and they're amazing and they're feel good. And it makes you really understand what they do and who they are serving and what the, that looks like after that, that event follow-up, those are all people that are, are humming with how important the work is. And they're also very good at event follow-up, I have to say, but that is a great way to start that pipeline. Um, usually the best way to start the pipeline isn't through an ask. It's through an invitation to learn more and to maybe even give some input. Tracking, caring, and cultivation systems. This is basic your basic structures. And it's not about necessarily buying a tiering system that's out there, but making one that's really um, a good fit for your organization. So one that gives you a way to tier potential prospects based on their capacity to give and their propensity to give. So how interested they are in their organization. And those two things are gonna give you a really good tiering system. Listen and engage with donors. And I really do mean listen. It's, it's hard sometimes to, especially when you're nervous and you're asking donors for money, you wanna talk. And one of the best things I can tell you is just pause and then wait another moment and then five more moments and let them fill the space because that information is priceless. Thank, value, and recognize donors and in different ways, not always just the way that they're asking you to. Report on outcomes, cannot say this enough. You need to keep people updated on their work. I mean, think of it, it's, an, it's a return on investment for them. So update them on their investment, evaluate your success. First, you think about how you define success and then find those ways to evaluate it and share it out. And then um, I have this sheet up and we'll share this later, but this is one of, I love open-ended questions that you can have in your back pocket when you're speaking to donors or potential stakeholders. And they give you those questions that allow you to sit back and just listen. Um, and a lot of these questions give you insight into what motivates them as a donor, and maybe even gives you some insight into their capacity, because through these answers, you could look up some various other things on how to find out how much they could give or would be willing to give or have given. And I think this is one of my last slides, some resources. You're breaking into this, you want to do some research, Foundation Center Online, GuideStar, you're looking up foundations, non, uh, 990s. And you're looking up a lot of individuals have family foundations and they also have 990s. So you can see who they've given to and exactly how much. It's a good idea. I am always about poaching other like organizations, donor lists and annual reports. A lot of those things are online. So you find an organization that's like you or one that um, you would find your archetype shares interest. So if you think of your donor archetype, who else do they give to? Who else would that archetype give to? And then thinking about organizations like that. And it may not actually always be the most obvious. Sometimes you might find that if you're running a program, let's say a permanent supportive housing program, that your population is transitional age youth. Instead of looking at other housing programs with transitional age youth, look at actual transitional age youth programs, maybe an arts program, or maybe one that's doing um, post-release programs. Uh, so that you see other donors that are motivated by similar outcomes. Like I said, board relationship mapping, helping your board think about who they know and actually doing that as a process together usually yields better results than having someone go home and just take it home because of that kind of process of thinking out loud. Partnering with other nonprofits, especially if you do not have the resources um, and or the toolkit, like a 501c or some of the other things you might need, partnering with other nonprofits to also build relationships with foundations and then each other. Um, I know it's a competitive field, but there is room in this field. I mean, we need, we need everyone in this room more than ever. And there's not, um, it's, I don't think it's a scarcity issue here. I think it's an idea of how can we all help each other build more, make sure these work, keep people housed, give people the services they need, um, and tweak those along the way too. I think sharing information about what's working and what's not in an honest way so that we all remember what the end goal of all of this is. And I think that's another big thing with philanthropy. It's grounding yourself over and over again in what you do and why you do it because when you share that of yourself, that's what other people want. They don't, they're not in it for the reporting and the data necessarily, they're in it because this is something they truly want to make a difference in, just like you did whenever you got into your job five, 10, 15, 20, 80 years ago. Um, so it's remembering that as well. So 
I hope this helps. We can answer more questions later. Um, but for now, I'm gonna popcorn it over to the wonderful Nina Dooley to take it from here. Thanks, Amber. Uh, and um, I really enjoyed your presentation and got some reminders out of that and really appreciate the shout out um, about our tours. Um, I would emphasize to everybody on the call that bringing um, people to your properties is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Um, it changes hearts and minds um, with elected officials, with potential funders, um, with uh, good people um, that do outreach like Amber. <laughs> so um, use, use your sites to, um, to help you tell your story. So um, that was a good reminder. I wanna share uh, as the case study today, um, Link Housing Spark at Midtown. This is our um, flagship for um, our venture into community development. It's just opening this week. We moved in our first few people um, coming out of homelessness and um, it's a real thrill for the, the whole staff. Um, we set a lot of high goals here and um, I'm gonna share some of those quickly. And we used philanthropy to try to make the dreams come true for all the things that we hope will happen at Spark. So let's move to our next slide. And um, it's ground floor commercial, community serving commercial over the top are 95 apartments. Again, it's on the blue line in Long Beach on Blanc Long Beach Boulevard. Half of the apartments are for general affordable um, individuals and families um, from 30 to 60% um, AMI. And then the other half, um, or for individuals and families coming out of homelessness. And then there's one manager's unit. The second floor, and this is one of the um, pictures we have so far, we haven't sent a photographer out yet because we don't have all the landscaping in, um, is um, part of the activity space on the second floor. That's where our residents will have all their um, counseling offices, um, our resident services coordinator offices are there, a room for after school program for the kids we're anticipating, computer lab, and then there's a big outdoor space um, with tot lot and seating and barbecues um, and um, shade spaces and things like that on that second floor. The ground floor um, has community serving retail. That was our goal, um, including a teaching kitchen uh, for the community to share, a meeting room for the community to share, and a mini park. So if we go to our next slide, um, we'll take a, a deeper look there. So this is the view of the ground floor. You can see on the right, the park where we've closed off Rhea Street and um, staff who've been to the property in the last couple of weeks um, watching a mural being painted um, down there have seen people already playing um, with the basketball hoop and, um, and the tot lot. So we're excited that the, the neighborhoods are already accessing the park. So if we go around there from the right, you can see the demo kitchen um, highlighted in yellow. This is a special feature that we've never done before where um, we're making that kitchen with uh, commercial equipment and extra tables and cameras um, and screens for the neighborhood to share. We've been working with the Department um, of Health and Human Services for how they might want to use it. Uh, Cal State Long Beach, Long Beach City College, um, the grocery co-op, lots of others um, are in conversation. Um, when it's ready to go and activated, we'll have programming there for the neighborhood as well as our residents. You can see that the largest spaces are anchor tenant, the YMCA, um, their youth institute, which is uh, media arts for teens uh, are getting their new home at Spark. I can't be more excited about that. It's an amazing program. And then also in that same space, we'll be counseling for neighborhood families that um, the Y does. So lots of um, services happening there for the neighborhood. The lobby is where our residents can enter and um, get their mail and also um, uh, take the elevator upstairs. So we'll see a picture of that on the next slide. Change Engine Productions is a social enterprise of the Y where they put their graduates and some current um, youth into a video making um, uh, enterprise. 
and they're uh, making um, video productions for uh, corporations and nonprofits. So um, that's fun. Dignity Health, one of our other partners, uh, will have a clinic um, with exam rooms. Uh, we're delighted to put health and housing together. We're still working on the cafe space. Um, we want fresh food happening at this uh, location. And um, I can't reveal where, we're, where we are in that right now, but know that that's a fun active space um, that we're um, still visualizing. And that community meeting space, we discovered in a meeting um, early on with Long Beach Forward members that they have nowhere for their organizations to meet if they don't have an office. And so we're um, doing our best to put a, a um, meeting space that can be reserved by um, Long Beach organizations. And then the bike parking for residents. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is that entrance from um, Long Beach Boulevard. Um, it's really pretty. We're, I haven't been there yet, which is unusual, and I'm excited to see it. So we aim high. Here's our wish list. Um, capital costs. Um, one of the challenges would be those tenant improvements. Um, when we're doing community serving retail, not everyone has deep pockets to build out what would happen there. That mini park, something new. Um, and then programs, which I think a lot of you are already doing with grants, but these are some of the highlights of the, the programming that we're fundraising for, um, for our residents at Spark. Um, data and research, our welcome home program. Um, we started this several years ago when we started opening our um, housing for people coming out of homelessness. They don't own silverware. They don't own bed sheets or towels. So our um, team raises money to buy those housewares. So they're, they're there, new, fresh, ready to go when our um, residents move in. And then we create a welcome basket for everybody who moves into the building. That's got the roll of toilet paper and dish soap and a gift card to the local restaurant and things like that, that you need when you move in anywhere. Uh, and events, we try to raise money for that too from local agencies. Uh, we did have a lovely ground break. Um, I hope someday we'll have a ribbon cutting, we'll find out. Next slide. All right, here's capital grants. This I think is the most unique and challenging. Um, and we've done this um, in a few different ways over the years. Um, we have raised capital from foundations for you know sticks and bricks going right into the building. Um, I would say that um, it's a chicken and egg process because our experience is that a foundation often wants everybody else committed before they'll commit to put their dollars in, but you've already made a budget with all the other um, government uh, agencies and funders saying that you're complete. So there's a little dance that has to happen there that makes it challenging from our experience and you need legal counsel. Um, you need your, your housing development staff open to how they want to manage um, funding dollars that go into the capital stack for your site. So sometimes some, one site is a little different from the next also. So it's a bit of a dance that you can't do on your own. You really need to have a team effort um, internally if you, if you do need capital from um, an outside source like a foundation. Um, to um, make sure that it fits well with, um, with the budgeting for the construction. So we've had the best luck when we're raising money for those special features, like I mentioned. You can see here um, the mini park and the community outreach. Um, we got a section for a capacity grant for that. Uh, and that really allowed us to have an event with the neighborhood. I didn't focus on that little inset photo, I should have. We had 200 people come um, to a party that we called Spark Park Pop-Up um, to help us uh, get feedback on what they wanted in their park. Um, and we had a DJ, we had um, bouncers, um, community booths. It was a really fun event um, and we had help um, from our partner um, City Fabric um, to help us put that on but but it costs money to do all that and so that section four grant helped us uh, there. The teaching kitchen, lots of appliances, equipment, tables, those video screens, 
foundation really gave us a generous grant to do a good job. So that'll be a great amenity for the neighborhood. We um, were able to get some of the ground floor um, interior work from another bank foundation, two generous grants from the same bank. And broadband was a challenge connecting um, to the city. Um, so a lot of that construction piece was funded by uh, another bank. Um, and then with all fundraising, you don't get everything you ask for. You try to have the best rate you can, but I'm showing what, what else happened there. We had four additional grants for capital and planning um, that we did not get. And um, I'm, you know, that was 152,000, but we managed to bring $360,000 into um, the capital and build it out for Spark. And we may get a little more. We're, um, we're delighted with that success. Let's look at the next slide. This is program grants, and I think a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, but one unique thing we were able to do is one of the banks involved in the, um, the capital for this uh, was willing to give us a 10-year grant for programs and help pay for staffing. Um, we've not had something with that kind of um, longevity. So um, I'm delighted to share that that's a possibility. Go for it. Um, same bank um, had an individual year grant where we picked up another $10,000. Denied, you know, gave it some try. Um, economic empowerment um, and things for the ground floor retail, community outreach, resident programming. You, you can see some of those other um, activities. Are we done? No. We're, we got lots of good vision for this property. So um, we have more grants on the way that we're going to try. Let's look at the next slide. Here is our welcome home program. This, these are the housewares and things that are in those 47 apartments um, for um, people moving in um, now. So these are coming from various sources and um, it doesn't quite mirror what Amber was showing for what a traditional um, entity um, brings in, but this is where our individuals um, really are moved to help us. So we've got cash gifts um, from 26 different donors um, equaling, you know, th there's 3,895. We did the um, Long Beach Gives um, peer to peer fundraising um, and 43 more donations came in there. Um, my own church did um, housewares drive. Churches are um, a really good source for filling some of these other needs. Um, and they were able to complete the housewares for 11 apartments and um, that's is a real feel good thing for them and for us. And, um, involving the community in your projects, I think is a, is a real win. Corporate cash gifts, um, four donations, and then corporate in kind. We had some really generous um, uh, gift come in um, to supply some of the uh, housewares for all 47 apartments. So um, you can see the value on that is, uh, you know, $66,000. These are things that aren't you know, this is above and beyond. These are the things that we think we need to do for people coming out of homelessness so that they do have a chance to succeed and thrive in their new place. Um, let's look at the next slide. I've got the tallies. Uh, so capital grants and programming grants, the welcome home I separate out between cash and in-kind. So at this um, one building so far, we've been able to raise um, 730 $36,000 worth of additional um, amenities for the community and for our residents. I think it's well worth the effort. And um, I want to give a big shout out to Stacy Slevkove, who I think is on the call, who um, spearheaded um, the grant work, and to Heather Pentecost, who um, did all the individual donors, um, and the rest of my team that, um, that really worked on Spark in concert with housing development team and asset management team and others. It's a it's group work and, and resident services to make sure you have everybody um, on the team on board with the right messaging and their needs that you know you need to meet to help them be successful with all the things that all staff need to do at a building like Spark. Um, let's look at one more slide. Um, these are kids from our Willowbrook project, but there's so many wonderful things about fresh food um, here that I, I wanna share their enthusiasm and, 
enthusiasm and honors for um, for this property. And uh, I hope this encourages you to add add fundraising and value to uh, to your work at at um, at your buildings. Thank you. I'm going to hand off to Ami, uh, who's going to take the conversation to um, the next level. I mean, I think your camera's not on. Yes, I am. Going to share my screen here. Thank you. I was really um, touched by the um, uh, comment Amber made about uh, the funding that we do is to make wishes come true. And um, Nina's uh, comment about how it is a chicken and egg process, especially when it's philanthropy uh, combined with real estate development. Um, I want to talk uh, today about Mercy Housing California's uh, resident services programs and how we fundraise for them, as well as our real estate uh, deals in California. Um, I'm, I'm briefly going to touch upon our sources of funding and strategic philanthropy, which is our approach to long term fundraising, and um, give you a little bit of a background about who we are. Um, we are a national organization with a parent company based in Denver. Uh, the Mercy Housing California office is based in um, the headquarters are in San Francisco Bay Area, and we're a, a 40 year old old nonprofit and we own and operate um, housing for families, seniors, veterans and people at risk of homelessness. And we currently own about 10,290 homes in 149 properties serving uh, close to 20,000 residents. And um, key to our work is that 83% of our properties have services on site or through referrals. Our philanthropy department, several of whom are on, um, on, the, um, on the webinar, thank you for joining, are made up of uh, seven people, three in Sacramento, three in the Bay Area and one in LA. And we raise funds mostly for programs um, and sometimes uh, for capital. And our approach to funding our resident services programs are that health, education, economic stability are key drivers of cradle to college success. Our uh, large capital grants are deployed uh, towards unique financing structures or as leverage for community centers in our public housing communities, such as Sunnydale and San Francisco. Speaking of San Francisco, you'll see here that our core markets and our active markets, we started uh, in San Francisco, uh, which was a very active market, but are now doing a lot of work in uh, the Los Angeles, Orange, and even San Diego area. So our presence is uh, in, uh, oops, in five geographies. Um, as far as the core markets are concerned in six in um, the active markets. Our seven person philanthropy team fundraises for the programs in, in our active and core markets. Uh, how tired to, to interrupt, it seems like people can't see your share screen. You wanna try doing that again? Oh. Let's see. I Can you try to share it at the, yeah, there we go. Ha -ha. Okay. So were you not able to see the screen in the beginning? I don't think they were. Oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, sorry about that. Let me quickly, okay, here's the first two pages of my PowerPoint. Background sources of funding and our strategic philanthropy approach. And then um, Mercy Housing, um, our background, as well as our seven person philanthropy department and our focus, which is uh, funding mostly a resident services program and some large capital grants that we do raise or deploy towards our unique financing structures and sometimes uh, as leverage for community centers in our public housing properties. 
We are in, um, we are developing mostly in San Francisco, LA, Orange, Sacramento, and Yellow, and Yolo, and have active markets in um, Alameda, San Mateo, Placer, El Dorado, Yuba, and San Diego. I uh, will skip this slide as I had mentioned this uh, previously. 45% um, of our housing developments are family, 28% supportive and 27% senior. This figure is very striking in that $11,700 is the average income of the residents we serve and it rises to 21,292 when zero earners are excluded. Striking in that most of the people we house earn very little to no income. And a profile of our residents demographics um, is on this chart. And what I wanted to highlight here is that Mercy is embarking upon a racial equity, diversity and, initi diversity and inclusion initiative at the board level and at the staff level, both California-wide and nationwide. And we are really aiming to reflect the demography of our resident population. Looping it back to the topic of um, fundraising, grants make up a large part of our funding sources, especially for resident services. Uh, this past year, we raised uh, about 4.9 million from private and corporate foundation partners, as well as some contracts. And donor income continues to be tallied, uh, but unique to this past year was over $2.3 million in COVID-19 specific grants, uh, rather gifts from donors that we receive. Galas and events, um, we do every two years. Uh, they net between $400,000 to $700,000 and our national office in Denver also um, host um, annual events. And um, this past one we did uh, gross about $675,000. Earned income is uh, an area of revenue generation that we are exploring. And, um, and we are doing that through social enterprise options to help uh, fill gaps in funding, especially in our uh, Sunnydale um, properties in San Francisco. The three leg legs of a stool that you might hear a lot in fundraising is grants, donors, and events. And, um, you know, traditional sources of our, of our fundraising, as I mentioned earlier, is a lot of grant writing, a lot of case building, and then a lot of um, um, site visits. Um, individual and major donors we also cultivate because they help raise the visibility of Mercy Housing's uh, values of respect, justice, and mercy. And then events continue to um, raise the visibility of our key initiatives, especially our racial equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative. Um, please save the date for May 19th. We will be having a, a, a virtual gala um, from 5 to 8 p.m. Details to follow and our speaker will be Van Jones, a CNN author and um, correspondent. And um, uh, the theme of the event is uh, di breaking the digital divide. Or wait, <laughs> it is um, bridging the divide, perhaps breaking the divide too. Um, and then this is really the, the key message here for today. Um, Mercy's approach is really to find purpose aligned funders um, because we want to really make sure we achieve sustainability and um, provide long term funding for our resident services. We, uh, while we do, um, you know, while we do seek funders that fund large amounts, we typically reserve them for um, new and innovative programs. Um, an example is a $2 million application that in uh, concert with Abode Communities 
um, California Community Foundation and LA Family Housing, who is the uh, applicant and our lead, we uh, submitted a $2 million application to Wells Fargo and Enterprise uh, Community Partners for a $40 million revolving uh, PRI construction loan fund to secure working lines of credit for modular housing. Um, we did not receive the grant, but we continue to pursue this innovation um, because we do believe that, um, that this will uh, set the tone for future modular developments and streamline the process. Um, the Ferguson Fund is a grant that a colleague, um, Shashi Jeevan and Mary Kelly helped secure. And this really illustrates the um, alignment that I talked about earlier. Uh, how we reached them had more to do with, uh, it was a bequest and they were looking for uh, uh, nonprofit developers, specifically in the Bay Area, that were aligned with their Catholic faith and values. So we um, we really leveraged the Ferguson Fund was a $30 million request and we leveraged it to fill gaps in uh, four of our properties, uh, Casa de la Misión. We, um, with a $30 million grant, we used $5 million of it to um, help fill the gap in this Mission District property. Actually, I will show pictures here. Um, and then Alameda Senior Housing, Hacienda, Uptown Senior Housing. So really what, um, what we um, gained from this uh, new donor was the ability to really support our, um, to support this, the speed with which we completed these, these um, developments and communities. And um, strategic philanthropy, um, it differs from charity. Our approach is, I mean, we call ourselves the philanthropy department, but that makes it seem like we're giving money, but instead of raising money, but we also are approaching it from the perspective of um, really uh, providing a long-term partnership with our residents and making sure they succeed. And um, whereas charity sometimes involves immediate relief and sometimes can present itself as benevolence. Um, I was reading about the whole Sean Penn Dodger Stadium <laughs> at speaking of charity uh, debacle earlier uh, this um, week. Sorry, there, sorry to interrupt again. There seems um, someone's asking, can you put the um, slideshow in like, or the your PowerPoint in slideshow mode just because it's moving around the screen a little bit. Oh, okay. Let me see. So I would go up to slideshow on the tabs up top. Mm -hmm. Um and it should give you an option to then have it populate your full screen. So it says home insert. There you go. Sorry, I keep breaking you up. <laughs> oh, okay. And then this is a well, almost near the end of the slideshow here. Really, this is just uh, imagining the future uh, post pandemic. Our goal really is to retain, oops, <laughs> retain the, um, retain our COVID-19 funders. Uh, we raised about over $2 million specifically for COVID-19, but the really, the hope here really is to, is to retain um, and keep uh, involving our donors and foundations um, in funding our work and then really daydreaming about how we can build upon the efficiencies of the, of the Ferguson fund model. And then hopefully in 2024, someday we can elevate and celebrate the successes of the nonprofit housing ecosystem. And then that is it. Wonderful, thank you. I think we're gonna start taking questions now. Does that sound good panelists? Um, so if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, it looks like, I'm just gonna quickly look at this. Our first question would be, how significant is board structure and positioning for successful private philanthropy grants? And I, I can take that one. The other ones it looks like for, our, for others. Um, pretty important, but more than who's on your board, it's how involved your board is with your organization, at least philanthropically. So I um, also work with a lot of federally qualified healthcare centers. So they have 
they have to have a majority community member consumer board, right? So we, we, we don't have, those aren't traditional fundraising boards, yet we can still go after large foundation grants and other big gifts because everyone is giving something. So for some of those gifts, I'm looking at like $20, but the, the idea of 100% board giving is still there. So I think that is more important, the 100% board giving, rather than how much the board is giving and showing that for your, um, let's say, higher capacity individuals that perhaps they are making gifts that are sizable for them. Um, but board structure, I think it's important at the end of the day, I mean, we're not, we're not chasing funding. We're not letting the tail wag the dog here. If you can show why your board structure is intentional and why it meets the needs of your organization, I think that's what matters more than anything else because your board, your governing board is there to meet your mission, help you meet your mission. Um, I hope that answers that. And if any of, uh, obviously more questions, if you need follow-up, um, can each organization, Nina and Ami, repeat how many people you have on your development or fundraising teams? I, I think Ami shared that. Um, I think she's got seven. Um, Link has a smaller team um, that combines with other activities, um, including community outreach and things. So I would say on our team, I would give it 2.5 um, full-time um, staff. And, um, you know, it'd be lovely to have more, but it hasn't been the major thrust of our organization. Um, I see that as a growing piece of um, what we're going to do. Um, and so stay tuned. If we do this again in a year, we'll see if 2.5 goes up. Um, and and then I, I saw there was a question also about um, funding ground floors um, for the commercial. You know, our hope was to be able to have as much um, available in the budget to manage that out of the, the general construction budget. Um, as with all buildings, not everything, um, you know, runs as expected with costs. Um, so part of that money is, is coming from um, um, the definitely from the overall construction budget. And then uh, our team is raising as much as we can for the TIs, the, um, the tenant improvements um, that are going within those spaces. Um, so it's sort of a mixed bag of, uh, of how that's working out. And our team is, is really in sync with the um, uh, project manager. So how can, we, how can we help? What do they need? How is it going? And so um, I would say there's been a good communication for since our first grant was written in 2017 for that building for capital um, to try to make sure that the ground floor has um, the reality um, that we all envision. Beautiful. Question about um, program evaluation. How, what systems do you use? How do you track outcomes? Ami or Nina. You can also say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have, you know, uh, we uh, typically uh, meet uh, every other month with our resident services team and have an active database that fills in um, number of residents served for our multiple programs, especially for um, uh, food access and security. Yeah, I think this directly ties to um, obviously the kind of programs you're trying to raise money for. So it's it's coming up with the metrics needed to fulfill whatever that is, and then just tracking that at um, those you know monthly meetings you have with support staff and residential staff. But for example, if you have a program that is, I don't know, your ancillary services workforce development, and that's really what you need private funding for. It's coming up with you know two to three outcomes that are really demonstrating success success in that and checking on those pretty regularly, but I don't think folks need a super, mm, you know, sophisticated tracking system because it should be rather simple, but um, it's more about what you're tracking and what you're choosing to track. Um, um, I, would, I would answer um, that uh, for our company uh, just a little differently. We, I would say we're really, our fundraising team is really tied to the budget. 
Mm. And um, our goals are in the operating budget of the company. Um, and I'll answer another question. Yes, we do um, raise money for general operating um, and for pilot programs to help the company grow and things like that. But um, what my role here today was to provide a case study for adding to um, how do we fill gaps at buildings. So I focused on um, Spark. Um, so our goals are there in, in each year's budget. Uh, and we try to forecast out for three years of what we think we can do. Um, additionally, we have a new strategic plan and there are a lot of goals in that strategic plan that are gonna take capital, um, whether that's in um, new sources of capital for um, housing development and this team works on that, uh, whether it's expanding programming um, for a, now we're working on economic empowerment and how do we grow that for our residents? So we'll be funding for that. So those sorts of things tie to those other um, organizational documents. That's, that's how we're generally tracking our success. That's great. I just wanna say something to piggyback on that as a, a reminder for strategic plans. Um, when I do that with my organizations, I try to remind them that it has to be living and breathing, like don't just put it on a shelf somewhere. And so one of the easiest things to do is just try, like report on your strategic plan at every single board meeting. And that will then create a function where, whereas you have to gather that information from staff. And so it's your checks and balances. So using your strategic plan as the um, impetus for your checks and balances, I think is super important because you have the information there, you know, at some point you went through a lot of time and effort and resources to figure out why you're doing it and how and and really put a lot of um, thought behind that. So use it, right? Um, let's see other questions. There was a question about uh, post-pandemic retention of donors. I saw that mm. uh, from Ken. Um, just wanted to is. say that what we are making sure during our outreach to our COVID-19 uh, donors is that how important it is to continue funding services because um, what the pandemic really did is put into sharp focus how people that are earning $11,000, for example, per household really, really needs uh, uh, to continue to, to secure um, food resources um, in addition to workforce development um, uh, opportunities. I would add to that uh, technology, um, that that was one of the things that COVID really exposed um, that our residents didn't have enough of their own technology to have their kids in school and the parents at work uh, all to be, you know, in the same place. They didn't have enough equipment. So um, that's an ongoing need that we see. So keeping in touch with those donors who really care about that issue, um, maybe will help us expand um, what what our residents have access to. That's great. I see a question here from FISA about um, advice for developing fundraising structure, or pursuing grants for a staff member at an organization where fundraising is only part of their role. So essentially how to begin fundraising or do fundraising when you don't have a large staff. And that is where I would say focus is a huge thing. And even some front end planning and research I think is really important. So thinking about funders out there and what they're most likely. So what is your gap? What you what do you need actually funded? And then what are funders most likely to fund? And then focusing those in, because instead of going after four different kinds of programs and four different kinds of grants, which are going to take a lot more time, it's coming up with kind of your one lowest hanging piece of fruit that is the most fundable. And that way you're able to recycle narrative, recycle language, and really, really home in on what that case for support is. And that will take a lot less time. So I would say just doing some real good pre-thinking on out of everything we do that isn't fully funded, what do we need money for? Um, and then does that, for lack of a better word, is that sexy to funders? Is that something that is really going to appeal to folks? And finding that perfect balance and then just going after those to begin with until you have more resources to um, you know, fund more staff and more efforts in that regard. It's a good question because I, I think a lot of folks are starting somewhere, right? You're starting from what you have and it's how do you, how do you manage time and energy? Let's see, other questions? We're at time. Ooh. 
So exactly. Well, I think all of the panelists had their inf contact information in their slides. So hopefully if people have follow-up questions, not just to offer Nina and Ami's time forever, but <laughs> you know where to find everyone. Thank you. <laughs> hope it was helpful. Yes, we absolutely hope it was helpful. Um, again, if you have any questions, contact, inf contact info is there and good luck out there. <laughs> <laughs>